Kia ora katoa. Uh, it's great to see everybody and uh, welcome to Territory 3 webinar. Very excited today to have John Wickstrom joining me, founder of Magic Memories. Welcome, John. Thank you, John. Loving your, loving your background there. And um, this is a story I'm, I'm really enjoying uh, listening to again. It's one that I've heard a few times over the years. We met uh, some years ago, but um, I think for a lot of us, it's going to be... Um, yeah, quite inspiring and um, yeah, really appreciate you taking the time to share, John. So um, just to kick things off, would love to, uh, for you just to tell the audience a little bit about yourself and Magic Memories. Sure, sure. Thanks for the opportunity. I mean, we have been on our journey for over 20 years now and the fact that we've grown to 16 different countries, um, picked up the family and gone and lived in different countries and been through COVID, so, you know, three, four capital raises now. I hope that there's something that we can share um, with those that have aspirations to export and grow businesses and stuff. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm intending to be as authentic as possible and answer questions with, with, with honesty for everyone because I think that is the most helpful thing that we can possibly do um, when you've got a few grey hairs uh, like myself. So uh, we, we started, it's, it's interesting, we started, I came out of marketing um, from university just in the early 90s and a colleague of mine at work in Queenstown said, why don't we take photos and, at the top of the gondola and sell them? And to me, the concept seemed easy enough, um, but what we went and did, and this has really started the DNA of the business, we went and actually saw what customers were doing. Um, and we went and did some research on that. And that was over two days. And we saw back and then in the 90s, it was 100% it was analog. So there was no digital, um, very little web. So people were going on an attraction, getting their photo taken, loving the experience, right? Whether it was on a jet boat or skiing. And then they were going after the attraction experience to a photo shop, seeing their picture on a wall, um, having to order it, it would take two to three hours till they had to come back and pick it up. And then it was a photo in a black and white folder and a brown paper bag. And for me, that was the first penny drop moment looking for problems to solve. And the problem one was time. So I got really excited about time. How can we give people their two to three hours back? And we simply solved that by, you know, there wasn't sustainability in such an environmental Im impact thing going on then. So we decided to print products and deliver them straight away. Um, and if they wanted reprints, we'd take them to their hotel so, and drop it off under their pillow. So we solved that two to three hours. I mean, then, the, then we, I fell in love with the story we could tell because I wasn't a photographer. And I figured if we could tell a story about you being in Queenstown, going down a river or going up a gondola and make you part of that story, um, that's a better product. So we put a lot into design and storytelling in our first product. Those two things we obsessed about customer service and storytelling when people are celebrating being together at places they desire to spend a lot of money to go to. Um, and that everyone thought, oh, look at John, he's out building a photo company. And that was fine when really I was obsessing about, about building a customer service and content slash storytelling company. And throughout the advent of the internet and particularly mobile phone, when now it's a ubiquitous thing to be able to tell stories yourself on your phone. We have access to content like imagery, stories, assets like Lego people and things like that, that we can now make better content than you can yourself and get it onto your mobile phone to, to augment your own experience with better content about yourself. So sticking to those core principles right at the start has enabled us to grow I mean, pre-COVID, we were we'd gone from nothing, so an idea to about 1,800 staff, nearly $200 million in revenue annually, and we were growing pretty quickly. Um, so it actually created something that was very desirable, that solved problems, and that attraction partners wanted. So it's been from realizing that's what drove the business and was our core driver. It was it's been fundamental to continuing to grow the business through changes in customer behavior and technology. Very cool, very cool. And I, I love the starting point at the top of the gondola. Um, yep. I'm really interested just in terms of today, in terms of what you found in those two days, is, you know, just in terms of consumer behavior, which we're all trying to figure out for a lot of our 
startups to really you know serve either our customers who have consumers or direct to consumer what's what's you know other than the digital i suppose but you know there's nuances of that what what's changed from those two days at the beginning you know 20 years ago versus today well we had a it's a good question it's, and it's again fundamental to where we are today um in 2013 um one of our partners who was running the sydney tower um he was a director and uh, uh, a manager for Village Roadshow, he came to me and said, John, you know, I'm not even going to go to tender or RFP, but I'm building the world's biggest water park, which was the Wet and Wild in Sydney. And he said, oh, but I want the most engaging customer experience um, across all age groups. And he goes, I've been a partner of yours for some time. And we were head down growing with our model, right? But he goes, I've been a partner for yours for some time. I want the 18 to 35 year olds to engage with our product more. And so it was a great challenge. And we actually did the same thing again in 2013. I personally and a couple of others went up to Wet and Wild on the Gold Coast and we spent days talking to those actual customers at Wet and Wild and the Gold Coast, actually living in their lives, asking them questions. They, I mean, they're running around in bikinis and togs and that sort of thing. And we're there That's trying to help. <laughs> no, but we're trying to be authentic and get get good feedback. Anyway, we went back to this guy, Chris Warhurst, um, who was running these parks and building this park. And, and I said to him, mate, we've got three outcomes. I said, all guests want uh, content, all age groups. They want photos, videos. They want all the content they can eat that shows them being there and having fun. Uh, two, they want them on mobile. So they want them on their mobile phone. And three, they want them for free. Right, they expect them for free. And I guess as a founder, two of those make real sense, right? So let's go. The other one was tricky. They want it for free. So, um, but we decided to figure out how to solve all three of those problems again. And we did. So Chris, Chris opened up Wet and Wild Water Park, offering every single ticket type the access to free digital content. So he put his prices up without no, the customers didn't know that. And he included digital content as part of the ticket. So now every ride you went on, you got your photos taken, it went straight to digital kiosks and straight to your mobile phone. And he was able to put several million dollars onto his bottom line. Um, the feedback was we got that engagement across every age group, um, uh, 18 to 35s, whatever. And, and we, they, were, they were loving the social and digital experience. And, we did get feedback in that first year that it wasn't, it was good feedback because they wanted more of those experiences. So that fundamentally changed the flow of money. So the theme park was then paying us to enable that content experience, which became a key to their offer, which he could monetize through tickets. And then we were still able to upsell on site and online post that visit. So that was the change when we said, Shivers, this is the way of the future of how we embrace mobile phone, how we embrace content creation and distribution. And like any New Zealander, I guess, we sticky tape that solution together. It worked and we delivered it on day one, but it wasn't able to be scaled. So that we made an absolute strategic decision. That's the place in the market we want to own. We want to be the best at it. So we had to go again raise the capital, build a completely new team, restructure the board, the executive, and that sort of thing to be able to deliver, deliver that experience. And that's predominantly our majority offer now, and we're just getting better and better and better at it, of putting content more in a more frictionless sense, direct to guest mobile phones as part of an attraction experience. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, it makes absolute sense. And I, I want to come back to a couple of those elements, particularly around pricing and your value to your customer, because I think there's some real insights there in terms of something that a lot of our founders struggle with um, in terms of one, how to sell to customers with the best proposition and two, you know, actually developing a pricing model. But um, let's round out the magic story with, uh, with 2020. Um, so you're 1,800 people, 200 million in revenue, and then 2020 comes along. Can you, can you give us the insights and the, the kind of experience there? Yeah, very, it's very clear in my mind, John. Uh, so uh, come the end of March, so the cool thing is that we saw COVID impacting our attractions in Australia and New Zealand around January. So when 
when um, Chinese New Year visitors were unable to travel, it impacted on our volumes to Australia and New Zealand attractions. So our CEO, uh, who actually is that guy, Chris Warhurst, who we built for that water park, he said, mate, this is gonna change the industry. And we were able to get him to join us as our CEO with an operator's mindset. That was a key for us. But he said, look, it's possible this thing could jump borders. It's possible it could go to market. So he'd already planned an A, B, C, D scenario that he had us all ready to go and we were going to pull a pin if it happened. And seriously, in March, every day from about the 18th of March to the 29th or so, I was waking up and just getting emails and Monday board updates of sites that were closing. And I mean closing, 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 closing. So that's 90 eight percent of our revenues right we have some e-commerce revenue but all of a sudden our complete revenue stream dried up over two weeks so chris said we're pulling plan c um, and that meant that we went from 1800 odd employees to 15 one five in 72 hours wow and we we did that because we had to turn the taps off because we owed more money than we had in the bank because it's our lowest trading quarter um, we had no revenues, we had overheads to pay, still had rent and stuff to sort out like everyone on this call, and we had to protect the business. So we figured we had seven, eight months left if we continued to make about 15 odd, 20,000 US a week in e-commerce revenue, we figured we had an eight month runway to A, do we have to solve this by capital raising or can we get through this? And my entire time was spent talking to suppliers, talking to partners, talking to our staff, our people, our employees. And we just said right out of the gate, we've got to be authentic and we've got to tell them consistently what's happening and update them. And because we had this good ramp up coming into COVID, we were creating more customers, we were creating more revenue per customer, and we we're creating more margin per customer. We were confident we should be able to raise money to keep the business alive, even though airports were being um, turned off, planes were in deserts, anything to do with the word tourism, even though we're, we're tourism technology, we were bad bank, right? Because um, there was no, no future. But we toiled very hard. Um, we got independent support from Northridge Partners, a New Zealand company, um, an advisory role. Um, our shareholders, our board of directors, executive Chris, our CEO, worked tirelessly and we eventually raised capital at a very discounted rate, but 18 and a half mil, so New Zealand dollars, 25 and a half million New Zealand dollars. It allowed us to turn on as the attraction started opening up again in July. It allowed us to continue to innovate, allowed us to put the lights back on. Um, and since that investment by my, predominantly led by Pioneer Capital out of Auckland, um, supported by ASB Bank and supported by New Zealand Trade and Enterprise, very much so, we, we, we were able to get there. And the best advice that we had through that process was to be very conservative when the taps are gonna turn on again. So we, we waited, we, we forecasted out two years until, so we haven't even got there yet, until we get normalized volumes. And thank goodness we did that. And then Roger and his team at Northridge Partners, we thought we needed this much. We thought we needed to raise about 15 Kiwi. And he went and modeled it and said, we suggest you raise 25 and a half Kiwi. Um, do it once, go hard and, you know, make sure you've got some left over. And we were lucky we did that because since COVID, since we were able to start again sort of in September with the new capital, the last nine months, we've set up 70 new attractions across six new countries. Um, with this new model, contactless, digital first, adding value to tickets so people don't have to drop their ticket price for domestic audiences um, and come out super, super strong to actually grow the business. So when the volumes eventually do come back in the next year or so, we're a much better business, creating more customers, more revenues, and more margins. So, man, it's been a it's been a year of it's easy to say, but it's been a year of two two halves. That's for sure. Yeah, totally. And if you pardon the pun, you know, like an absolute roller coaster by the sound of things. <laughs> so, um, you know, leadership you talked about a lot there in terms of really just sort of setting the scene to actually go forward and figure this stuff out. I mean, for you, and you know, mental health's a big thing that we focus on for. Uh, 
for founders because you get left alone with a lot of these decisions and you know with a lot of stuff and a lot of responsibility in your head how did you manage that when you know you're getting those emails every morning just basically seeing things switch off i think for this audience i can i, I can answer that two two bits first one as a founder um if you have a vision that's realistic and you can articulate it clearly, you do create followership and that's your biggest strength as a founder. Um, but also the key is knowing uh, what your strength is and what you're good at and what you're not good at. So in 2015, when Chris joined us, I was CEO founder, but he came in as CEO. The business was large. We had private equity investors and in. EBITDA was important. Growth was important. That stuff's not my strength. Growth and partnerships and customer journey and products, that's my strength. But it's about knowing when to hand over those reins. And, and that happens in CEO, finance, board of directors. You've got to design your business to your future strategy and surround yourselves with people that are way better than you in areas where you're weak, right? So they can guide you through shit you don't know. I, as an example, I used to... Um, I used to have a time in each board meeting when I was CEO that it was stuff I don't know. And it could be the silliest question, but if I had the right board members around me, I could ask it. They'd been there and done it before. So they'd go, John, I'll do this, this, this. I'm off again, right? For the next two or three months until I go, shit, now I don't know what to do again. What do you do again? So I think it's really important to know when to, what to give up and when to give it up and surround yourself with way better people that have, we have that mantra of, Surround yourself with winners. So, you know, in job interviews or board of directors interviews, they tell you good stories, but if they, I'd always ask, did you win in that story? Did you actually get that across the line? And many of them can tell you great stories, but if they didn't get across the line, I didn't want to be surrounded by them because they were talkers, not winners, right? So we, we wanted actionable people that were winners. And that, so that was the first stage. And as a founder, handing all that power to another CEO is really fun when you're teaching them the business, your vision, but when they pick it up and they run with it and you're the, not the CEO anymore and they have the relationship with the chairman and the directors, there's some stuff there we could unpack because you got to figure that out as a founder. That was psychologically quite difficult, I guess. To It's different than what you think it's going to be. Um, but I figured that out and just thought, how can I help Chris be as successful as he possibly can? Because he's way smarter than me. So that's that's how I got through it. And that's sort of the approach I took with it. Um, through, through COVID, he was relentless. I thought I worked hard. We managed, I mean, he's now got shares, equity, he's invested in the business, but he just worked relentlessly with advisors, bankers, shareholders to get that business across the line. He coordinated all the activity I was doing, legal, all, all the other senior leadership team people. Um, we had a board of directors that was super supportive. Um, and we had, a, a luckily, a major shareholder that was willing to double down on their investment and were at such tough times and work through a process with them that kept them engaged and the senior leadership team and, and board of directors engaged at the same time. So coordinating that was easy enough actually only I could never have done it on my own if, did, did that answer the question yeah maybe? yeah absolutely and you highlighted something that I would like to unpack too because I think you know I have these discussions almost weekly with founders either planning or realizing that there's kind of pressure coming from some of their stakeholders for that transition from founder to you know uh, founder CEO to, to not CEO um yeah, so I mean, in terms of unpacking that, how, you know, when did you, was that something you always thought was going to occur or what, you know, what sort of was the light bulb moment that that was going to be actually the better thing for achieving your vision? Um, I, I, with Chris, so, so when we decided to get a CEO and replace me, it wasn't let's go and find someone and try and replace John, it was holy shit, imagine if we could get Chris, the guy that's built theme parks, water parks, towers, a guy that's known globally as an operator of excellence in this space. Imagine if we could bring him on as our CEO and drive not only the narrative, but the delivery of this new 
technology-led guest experience, technology and content-led guest experience. So we got excited about that. And you know, we went and met him when he was flying around the world. We went and met him in the US. It took six months. And it wasn't until our business, because again, he's a winner. Um, he, he was someone that had been where we wanted to go. Um, it, these things don't happen overnight, right? This took six to eight months of, of courting him. We had to have done a big acquisition to double the size of our company by buying our biggest competitor in the US. Um, I was going over there to run that integration of bringing those two businesses together, which was probably culture first, which was a very heavy lift, but the business needed to be run and it was twice the size with new types of shareholders. So it was a planned, headhunted, I guess, shoulder tap strategy that, that we went for. What happened there? What happened there? Are we back? I can't hear you. We're back, mate. It's Silicon Wellington, I think. I dro I dropped out. I'm sorry, but I can hear you loud and clear. We're back on back on the road. Yeah. So that that was how how we designed that. And and again, when when we made the transition to to do the ticket inclusion model um, for the business, and as I said, we we sticky taped our first version together, setting up the strategy and formatting who we need in our team and whether it was at a board level, where the gaps were, or at a uh, executive level, again, that takes time. Because if you're going out to find winners who have been there and done that, then these guys or girls um, are not really out there looking for jobs. They're actually being headhunted or being chased. So you've got to make sure your proposition is so exciting and so valuable for them that they choose you over others. So that whole process, I think, of redesigning the capability of our board and executive took about two years yeah right yeah and i think that's a really good point and you know the the, the things i get um uh to intervene in obviously on a you know highly confidential basis is really around i guess where that contention comes that someone you know in the stakeholder group the board or the ceo or you know mixtures thereof says that there's someone who could do it better but you end up in a situation which is less productive where someone's you know basically saying well you know find me that person and I'll step down or I'll move aside. But, you know, really it's a transitional thing collaboratively over time, right? Yeah. And I think with the CEO role, the fact that we've already been doing business with Chris for six years and <laughs> it's, a, it's actually pretty funny in the sense that I, I say to Chris, oh, Chris, we became mates through this and I actually was really looking forward to getting you to lead our business. Um, and he said, well, you know, he's an Aussie, so he swears, but he's like, let's be effing clear, mate. If you didn't deliver, you wouldn't be my mate. <laughs> so, so again, uh, that CEO transition was super important to us because we have had several um, examples in very key roles where we've either got people and they haven't worked out or we've got people and then the business is growing further and we require more capabilities and they haven't been able to grow. So you know, at a board level, we've always <clears throat> said, it's not a right to be a board member, it's a privilege and you've got to add value. And we check that every year. But for a senior leadership team, if you're putting out, consistently putting out a three year strategy and they're continuing to add value to it and they're on board, you know they're the right fit. But if they're faltering or wavering on today or how that links to tomorrow's strategy, <clears throat> pardon me, you've got to move fast. You've got to, because we, we were growing quite quickly. And the thing is, I've, I've been guilty before when I was CEO of hoping those people would change, but you need to actually realize they're not linked to the future strategy and what they're doing today and they're missing balls. Unfortunately, you've got to remove those people or move those people on through the business and give them a chance of doing something else. And the faster you recognize that and the better you get at it, the better it is for them and the company. Yeah, yeah, dead right. Hey, um, just to our community, I see a couple of people have got raised hands. What we'll do is we'll go to Q&A um, as, a, as a bit of an intersection in about six minutes at about half past. So folks, if you do have some questions, could you please put them in the Q&A section, not in the chat? And, uh, and we'll jump into those in about uh, four or five minutes. Um, 
But John, you know, that, that aspect around, you know, when people reach their ceilings and so forth, and, and I want to jump sort of from here through to globalising, because I mean, that's kind of where that scale challenge often really, really hits you. Um, what have you noticed in terms of leadership? Uh, you know, 98% revenue loss is not something you would have had in any of your worst case scenario formats, I would imagine up until Chris's contingencies, you know, in January. Skills and sort of uh, skills and, and capability wise, what do you think leaders have had to actually really kind of um, focus in on that perhaps they wouldn't have had to before in a pre COVID situation? Well, we've always we've learned now to have a pandemic scenario plan. And, yeah. and, and, now, and luckily, we had a in our forecasting when we did our investment case, we had a second wave scenario. Um, so that's been very, very helpful. So I think uh, the, the, the capabilities that you require, I think what got us through more than anything was actually personal characteristics, which got you through those real times of adversity. And, and they were authentic, authenticity and integrity um, right. as much as anything, right? Because bullshit didn't, didn't stand a chance. Right. And, and also trying to paint a good picture, it got thrown out. You put it in front of a investor or whatever, it got thrown out. So the more realistic and conservative you could be with complete authenticity and integrity. And we, we, we said those words specifically very early on. This is how we have to speak to our people, how we have to speak to our investors, how we have to speak to potential investors. And it, it's held us in good stead. And we we at touch wood, we're yet to have any employment issues um, following such a massive, fast reduction in people. We were lucky with all the government subsidy schemes and all the different markets, but because we did it with authenticity and said, we here's our bank balance, here's what we owe, here's, we didn't plan this, we didn't want this, and we want to bring you back. Um, we've been able to bring, you know, a good two thirds of those people back because we've come back leaner, meaner, more systemized, more, um, uh, automated uh, in our systems, which a lot of companies have had to do. But the integrity there, I think we got lots of feedback from suppliers, partners. I, I had suppliers physically crying on the phone when we told them we could write their $90,000 US check, right? Um, so again, we'd built, taken them along the journey and said, we think we're going to get through this. But when you when you end up coming out the other side and you're bringing people back into your business and you're paying bills, it was, you know, from what was a tough few months, that was a pretty nice feeling. Yeah, very cool, very cool. So let's um let's switch it now to to going global. Um, and just those, <laughs> you know, if you were sitting here, there's a lot of founders here who haven't actually got out of New Zealand yet. There are some who've done it, you know, two or three times, but. You know, for you, what, what are sort of the most memorable elements of, you know, when you decided, I guess, maybe the context of getting out of Australasia and going after that first sort of customer, you know, much further afield? Yeah, our, we were lucky. We went to Australia and won Chris's business, um, which was several attractions. From that, we had people come and look at how we were doing things differently, more storytelling, better customer service, better products, more revenue, and ask us if we wanted to go to the to their business in the UK. So that was a natural growth into the UK. But we we did have a set strategy saying how we want to grow and the st steps that we would go. So we defined the markets we wanted, the attraction targets that we wanted, um, when we would do it. So what was unless we got dragged there, what was our point that we would enter those markets? Um, so they were actually pretty well planned. Uh, luckily, we were able to, because we chose English speaking, English law as our first markets, for an example, globally, we were able to scale with some consistency um, and we're able to replicate the same results, which meant we weren't bespoking our growth too, too much. It was more about building capability in markets. And in those early days as founder, I, you know, you have to commit yourself to building that culture. Um, in these new markets, because that's what you see it as a founder, creating that fellowship. So I, I took my family and we lived in London in 2013. We came back in 2014 and then went over and lived in the US for four years. And it's uncomfortable. We live in beautiful Queenstown, but you go and you take 
you have to make that commitment. I would be, I would be on a plane five days a week back in the weekends for pretty much that four years in the US because people, I mean, they get to know you a little over Zoom, but people get to know you by, people do business with people still, even though technology drives your business. So um, I found that key and one meeting doesn't mean they like you more than someone else. So four meetings possibly does. You, you build, they, they realize you have authenticity. They realize you're passionate about what you do and they want to be part of that journey that takes time. So um, that, that they, were, they were key things. I, I think the other, when you're planning those things, what I've learned the hard way is it will take longer and it will cost more. And, and what we did with COVID when we raised more than we needed, I would love to have done that the first time we raised capital rather than very New Zealand thing to do is raise just enough of what you think you need and you've never done it before. And then you have to go back and then you're late and then you're not hitting your numbers, right? It's friggin' awkward. And the best thing we can do is not make that mistake is by raising a little more than we need and it's not about giving away equity. It's about giving your business the fuel and the horsepower to ensure you will achieve your goal with some degree of error and mistake on the way. And you've got to fund for that. Yeah, I think that's great advice. Great advice. Hey, look, we'll, um, we'll shift to some <coughs> questions. There are some here. There's one from uh, Richard Reed, And clearly he's, he's chatted to you before. It says, Wick. You talk about great customer experience. Where do you see magic memories expanding? And, and have you got thoughts about going beyond tourism? Yeah, yeah. We're, we're building that model right now, um, Richard, which is anywhere you celebrate being together, can magic memories have an impact to either make the joining of those people easier, faster, or better? And so... We are already moving into stadium experiences, um, stadiums, which uh, we've got a partner football club, Barcelona, which is a pretty large, powerful brand. And they're working very closely with us of how we can create content experiences um, with their guests that are in the stadium that they can create off their own mobile phone. So we'll be testing that with them in the next um, few months. Um, also, how can we simplify the problems that really small ma and pa operators have, Richard. So those people that run their horse trek or their boat business, there's millions of them globally, but they can't afford large capital outlays. Um, they're trying to capture that experience with their customers, but they're doing it with a phone that they, or a, a camera they don't know how to use. They're running the chip back into a WhatsApp group that they're doing manual, and they might get their content tomorrow or 10 days later. What we're looking at is using our cloud-based operating system to be able to enable them to create a much better experience by just using the phone in their pocket, right? And so that'll open up another whole sector for us where it's a low to no capital startup, so very low barrier to entry, like a autonomous SaaS type model um, that then sits off the whole back end of our existing operating system. So it opens up another whole channel, whether you're an operator, an events organizer, um, to be able to set something up and have a complete commercialized end-to-end -end photo system, memory system, uh, e-commerce system um, for those small events. So we're trying to trying to think of it like what, what is our Airbnb, what is our Uber type model? So we're looking at creating that, which is completely aligned to our business and our operating system that we're in today. It just opens up another very large vertical for us. Yeah, love that. Yeah, love that leverage stuff. Um, this is from Paul Wilson. Hi, John. Can you describe how you pulled together your first board using external directors and when you knew it was time to do so to escape the bubble of founders? <laughs> I'll share a story with you because it's it's a good one. Um, a guy, Jeff Burns, um, who was in tourism, he'd been with Air New Zealand and Hertz, he'd taken Hertz, Hertz, I think, to the US. So he knew about expanding businesses and he came to me um, after we played a game of golf together, he came to me one day and said, look, I think the internet is a pretty big thing with tourism. Tell me what you're doing. And this is 2004. And I told him what we were doing. It took three hours. And at the end of it, he just laughed and he said, mate, that was really, really fun. 
and I loved listening to it all, but you're not going to do a third of it, right? What she has found is we go, what are you talking about, mate? So Eddie, but he told me, you're not going to do a third of it. So we asked him to help us and he helped us as a mentor, first and foremost, setting structures around some better governance, some financial reporting, some monthly reports, starting to get a strategy in place. And that was super helpful. We, we effectively tightened up our all these different entrepreneurial companies I'd had set up everywhere. He just simplified everything to make sure that our that you're looking from the outside in and we were tight, we knew what we were doing, it wasn't scattered, right, which it was. So he, he, he first, he tightened all that up. Then when we decided that we wanted to grow the business around 2008, more internationally, um, we got involved with New Zealand Trade and Enterprise and got put through into the Beachheads program. And as part of that, you have to present in front of about 14, 15 people. And we presented, got asked questions and we were so well planned that we were the second ever company to get instant, you know, thumbs up. You have being um, welcomed into the Beachheads program. And it was at that stage when our Beachheads advisor was a guy called Mark Bowman. And he was given, well, I didn't know him, but he'd asked really good questions. So I was pleased we got him. And he, he actually became my advisor. So I'd spend hours talking to him. And I realized the questions that he was asking me were brilliant. I'd never been asked these before. So I asked him, would you like to join Jeff and sort of let's formalize some sort of directorship because this is fantastic. And he said, no, um, because he was too busy. And then rang me one night and said, mate, I can't stop thinking about magic memories. I can still remember it, right? And then I was like, why good or bad and he goes I think you've got a tiger by the tail here son and he goes I'd like to be involved so he came in um, and took another level of structure he'd been there done that international growing technology companies and he set up and became our first chairman we then got our governance even tighter we reset our strategies with a guy called Wayne Norrie um, who came in and did a two-day session for us and said, you guys don't need any blue sky. He said, normally I do blue sky stuff. We, we, yeah. just need, we just need to focus on tightening up your strategy. So we did that. Then we figured out where our gaps were and Mark started plotting and suggesting where we might get more skill sets around a governance level flying at that 60,000 foot um, level um, and start, we padded out the board, added one more person, went to the US, figured out that we needed to know how to do high growth in the US um, who we needed, what skills we needed. And NZTE t &E went out there and did a search for us. And we found this guy, Craig Elliott, um, who was sitting on the zero board at the time. He'd run all his own successful companies, done IPOs on the NASDAQ, et cetera. And we went and I went and met him. I flew over to San Francisco and met him. And he still tells me, he goes, mate, I wasn't actually sure what you did on that first meeting. He goes, but how you, you were definitive that you were going to get there. So he he uh, he joined us and gave us that whole US perspective around health and safety, law, uh, things to look out for. Um, and again, so we as we set our strategy, and it was we 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 did strategy, structure, um, and people in that order. So as we set our strategy, where are the gaps in our what do we need in our structure to deliver it? Where are the gaps? Fill those. And, and with people. So strategy, structure, people was the mantra that we followed um, to be able to evolve not only our SL senior leadership team, but the board of directors. Um, wasn't the other way around. So if I play that back um, for a few, few, few younger folks in the, in the community, it's set your sights high and tell your story. And then, you know, even if people say no, uh, and, you know, for those of you who don't know, you know, Mark Bowman and, and Wayne Norris, well, Wayne Norris, the godfather of the Beachheads program, right? So these are what I would call serious wheels. We had plenty of other things to do, but um, you were kind of relentless in terms of the types of people that you gelled with and you could see that would actually add value and, and had the credibility to do it as well. Is that a fair, fair playback? 100%. Sweet. Um, Hirsch had a question. Sorry, we missed that earlier, Hirsch. Looking ahead, what trends are you seeing with visitor numbers at public spaces? And are some of your customers investing in digital experiences away from the parks or those public spaces? Thanks, Hirsch. Yeah, um, 
it's very i mean being in 16 different countries it's a uh, i'll pick some of the bigger ones that we know more about so australia right now is shut um you know our ceo and cfo have been in um been in lockdown for 11 weeks now um us is very much state by state so uh, we've got volume volumes in many states which are well up on pre-covid levels and then we've got volumes in some states uh, that are still significantly down 50-60%. Um, UK, we're seeing uh, lower volumes, but it's opening as their borders to open in more countries and more travel, but it's pretty slow. And in, the, in Asia, we're still seeing rolling lockdowns or, or volume restrictions because they might have one case of COVID in the, in the country or whatever, so they lock down these public places. So very hard to answer that across the board but at, at, at the moment we're lower uh about we're running at about 70 percent volume across all those countries compared to pre-covid um and the attractions themselves are certainly looking for how they can retain their ip which brings people to their park but give enough of an experience and contactless digital ways to continue to engage people with their brands um, so there's certainly, particularly those bigger parks that have more capital to spend, you look at, um, the, there's a lot of big groups and a lot of different markets, but certainly there's activity there of how you can digitize and leverage your IP without giving it away. And that's, that's the key to them. They don't want to give it too much of an experience that people don't come and buy their tickets because in our business, still the number one driver of revenue for those attractions is tickets. So the fact Very that we cool. can add we, the fact that we can add value to that now and add and add value to ticket yield is, I mean, some things good things come out of adversity and that's a good thing that's come out of COVID for us. Cool, um, Gary. I see your question there. We will um, we will roll that one into the first one at the end of the session. But just um, I think you know there's a there's a inflection point here that we haven't talked about and love your thoughts on, which is raising capital. And I think a number of the things you've touched on in terms of actually setting the company up and the vision. Um, you know, you've raised a lot of dollars um, over the journey. What would your perspective be to somebody looking to, to do this either for the first time or, you know, being close to having to, to do an investment around how would, you know, what would be the key things you'd suggest that they, uh, they look at to do that effectively? Um, benefits more than features, I would focus on you hear so many founders that may be technologically driven or scientifically driven and speaking about things that they're very passionate about because they live in it day to day but it doesn't resonate with me because I don't completely understand it so um, you you have to be passionate about the benefits or the problems you're solving and how you're solving them and then making sure that narrative um links directly to your revenues and margins and models right and growth because you know if you're going to put a hockey stick in any investor deck you have to make sure that first and foremost these people are uber excited about what you're doing and why you're doing it and the benefits of it and and get them to believe and build their own hockey stick but if you can't have that narrative that's really simple, really exciting, and focusing on the benefits of the problems you're solving. It's hard to get, you know, people turn off when you get to the hockey tick stick slide or the numbers that don't make sense. Because regardless, they they want to know, they want to know your, your size of your market. Um, so what's the market that this can address? Um, what's your what's your moat? So the size of the market, what what's why are you protectable why is why can't someone just come and do exactly the same thing tomorrow um who's your management team other than just yourself who have you got that you can actually give me confidence i can deliver it and explain to me how your vision and what you do today provides you the margin that you're telling me you'll get revenues and margins you're going to do um in in a year or two years time because they're, they're always an investor is looking at the who you are but they're also absolutely focused on history as a predicator of future. So what you've done predicates what you will do. And that's why as you're building a, a business, the best advice I ever got 
because what you do today, you should be thinking about someone in three years time looking back on it and going, wow, that was really smart, right? Each time you, whether it's a board decision, a strategy decision, you want to look ahead three years and look back to say, well, that's a fundamental thing that gave a point in time, which builds me in confidence that you're going to do it again in the future. Yeah, yeah, I think that's great advice. And, you know, there's a lot of support and you've talked about NZTE and, and you know, they're, they're a great partner of ours have been since the start of, um, of Landing Pad, you know, Territory 3. Um, how, you know, how have you found them? And, you know, obviously being a, a massively global company across, you know, at least, you know, well, more than 16 countries. And, and what do you, what's your advice as a founder, you know, to getting the best out of that sort of relationship or any relationship really that's um, offering you support, you know, that's not necessarily from an investor point of view? Yeah, we're, we're massive. It's a great question because I've heard lots of people I know and respect have had different experiences with NZTE. We, we are one that is an absolute 100% advocate. And me personally, I, I would do as much as I can to understand the services that they can provide you. And as much as you can try and get yourself accepted into the Focus 700. It might have even gone up now, I think, from COVID. It might be Focus 1500 or something. But get yourself as part of an NZTE accredited company where you get access to their networks and support. Because, I mean, I will ask NZTE for anything, whether it's research, whether it's boots on the ground, help in a market, whether it's setting up uh, countries, banking systems, insurances, I drain them. And, and we laugh about it because those services are there and you just have to ask and you get so much back. And there's even funding relationships which help you grow and help you invest in new people and new systems and new partnerships globally. It's been, for us, it's been, it's been absolutely fundamental in our growth, that, that relationship and the value it brings. But it sounds like you've been well prepared too in terms of what you, know, what you have to offer them to help actually let them help you effectively. Well, you've, it comes back to that integrity and authenticity piece is, You've got to, in business, you always have to take your hat off and look at how am I, how is this discussion adding value to John Holt, right? How is this discussion adding value to those people you want to sell to or those people you want to help you grow? So it's never one way. If you're one, if you're a taker, you get found out and no one wants to deal with you. But if it's always a two way street, so if they're in ZT&E, um, how can we help them? What, you know, we, we give them our, quarterly results, we update them with our performance to plan, we help them with any webinars they may do or something, it's, it will help people better explain how they may work with NZT and to get benefits, so it, it is, everything is a relationship two-way. Yeah, 100% agree, and just on that, you know, now getting into those those markets and, and selling, um, you know, wearing that hat, wearing that salesperson's hat, so uh, you know, you've got customers where you've got a really refined value proposition. Now, how do you, you know, how do you approach that? And and also, you know, from a pricing point of view, that's a big question that always um, has to sort of come up. Uh, how, how do you even begin to sort of get a platform to start thinking about how you price that once somebody says, you know, what, uh, what you know, we're interested, what's it going to cost us? Yeah. And we always do that at the end. So we have some, uh, again, in our business, we operate, even financially, we operate freedom, a degree of freedom within a framework. So it's about having frameworks um, of products, experience, um, operating margins, and commercial terms or pricing with customers. You have a framework that you can operate within. If you want to go outside that framework, you need to go and ask CEO, CFO, type thing. So you're not slowing the business down. Um, and so that, that's, that's how we operate. So we have those guidelines set and there may be six or seven different commercial models, but it's always at the end. So we obsess. I spent two hours this morning talking to a company in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, and we obsessed about what we've invested in, what we're going to achieve with them as a partner and give, gave them examples of the product experiences we could create. They were already butting in going, this is great. We love that product. How could you do that? Could we do this? So they were already on the hook, right? Loving what we had wanted to do. And that was our intent. That was our absolute intent was to let them know we know their business. We know their problems. We know their opportunities. 
So let's obsess about them first. We touch briefly on what we thought the commercial model would be, but that discussion will come later and be refined later. So we've given them the framework as well, but only will we have that discussion if they're completely on the same page as us with regards to the product and service and experience we're going to design together and the outputs we're going to create together, such as revenues, social sharing, customer engagement, right? And then the commercials are much easier to have because we've fallen in love with the product and service. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. And, and, and you know, did you always know that customer proposition uh, was there or did it take some time to refine exactly what the, the kind of the keynotes were to hit in terms of what you could improve their bottom line with? Um, no, it's continually evolving. But again, if we lift it right back to day one, if we're solving customer experience problems and creating more revenues um, by telling personalized content stories, um, we know that's the right thing to obsess about. But if someone comes and says, we want the product that does this, that doesn't necessarily mean that we've got the capability to deliver it. So you've got to also make sure that, um, like Steve Jobs said, you need to know when you're in your business, there's so many shiny buttons out there that we could chase, right? But you actually have to know what to say no to um, so that your customer proposition is strong enough and gives you your competitive moat and competitive advantage, but you're not distracted by, oh, we could do this, we could do this, we could do this. Otherwise, you're you know, you don't have focus, you don't get, to, you can't deliver and you can't grow and you haven't got a common narrative or customer proposition that can evolve. Yeah, you're dead right. Um, folks, we're in the last uh, 10 minutes and Gary had a question, John, about whether you foresee going into VR and AR experiences. Yep. So we have done, we have worked with third parties on creating a virtual reality experience with Football Club Barcelona. Um, and that's, again, that's part of the content offer um, that you would get as your, as your um, ticketed experience. Uh, and with regards to, and we, we're not sure we're going to continue to go down that. We certainly won't be bringing in our own skill sets of VR that we would use partners for that. Um, because it's very specialized, but it's also getting very crowded um, and it's very highly capital intensive um, and quite low volume, meaning if you've got a million person or two million person attraction, getting everyone to do that experience with the cleaning, the setup, the time it takes, whatever is. So it's a low volume, very high quality experience, but it's it's kind of like an adjunct. So we may not do it ourselves, but we would build that into our content offer with the partner. So it may be attached, for example, to our customer token, um, which is a QR code at most attractions or an RFID band, that customer token could be linked to that VR experience. Um, AR is very interesting. So we, we do a lot of development products. We have this de uh, developers kit for Snap and we create a lot of uh, AR products using the Snap Developers Kit, whether it's face paint, body filters, video games where you're chasing stuff in front of a big screen. And we'll capture the video or the photos off that and add it to your experience album. So that's that's a very high engagement model, the AR model, but at the moment we're predominantly using uh, the Snap Developer Kit to be able to create those products. Very cool. Well, that's all the questions. So, you know, sort of, Moving towards the wrap up, John, a couple of kind of founder centric questions. You know, if you were starting Magic Memories again today, what would be the one or two things that you would do differently? Oh, well, we didn't have a plan. Uh, we started it and it got a life of its own. Luckily, our, the thing we obsessed about the customer service and the content and storytelling gave us much higher returns and much nicer products, which our attraction partners and their customers wanted. So that just dragged us, but you know, I, I would, I've seen the benefits in planning. So planning and doing strategy structure people, but we didn't get into that until more than 10 years into our journey. So it probably slowed us down, even though it was a hell of a lot of fun. Um, and then when we started, you know, the other thing that we did wrong was in the first few times we raised capital. And again, I think this is quite usual in New Zealand, not usual in the US. And that's one of the things I learned living four years in the US is we chipped and putted with our capital raising. So you're doing it a lot and you're doing it reasonably often in small amounts. 
And whether I can't remember whether that was protect to protect equity or whatever, but it just slows you down. So I, I would challenge to have a grander vision, you know, of what how might we be a global company? What would that look like? Reset that strategy and then look at the structure and the people that you need and the capital that you need and go out and do that early and do that once. But um, you'll get where you'll get where you want to go faster. And, and it all becomes around having a very strong customer prop proposition, a strong total available market, a good competitive advantage. People believe in you and your team and you can go and raise capital. There's tons of it out there. That's what we need to understand. There's tons of capital there, even now looking for a place to use it. You've just got to be your narrative, your proposition and your story has to be big enough, digestible enough, and you have to be passionate enough about it with a strong narrative that you're better than the rest. And um, I, I, you know, I challenge Kiwi companies to think much bigger, plan much larger. And, and you know, Rod Jury is a classic example, mate, of what he did. So, yeah. And there's nothing, he's not, he's not built different than us, right? So... Um, it's out there. It's a, it's a US way of thinking compared to a New Zealand way of thinking. Yeah, 100%. And of course, the flip to that question is, you know, going back to a scenario where you're creating magic today, what would you absolutely do the same again? Uh, to me, you, you've got to have a real passion and around the, the reason why you are different or what you are doing. And you can only test that by talking and validating it to let don't you know we, we we are in love with what we do but if you're putting it in front of others and you can't clearly explain it and they don't want to be part of your journey you're not quite doing something right yet so um, you've just got to have that you've got to have a strong competitive advantage you've got to have a trick a trick that no one else does that's unique to you it doesn't matter if you're in banking finance technology, whatever, you've got to be up. You've got, you know something and think it's a way that whilst it may look similar to someone on the other side, you know why you're different and you need to protect that um, and, and, and make that a key part of your, your story and narrative. Very cool. <clears throat> well, mate, our time is, um, is just about up and I always just give the last word to you. You know, there's, um, there's a bunch of founders on here and, and people are supporting startups and so forth. You know, from your point of view, John Wickstrom, what what would be your biggest piece of perspective for somebody who's in the middle of the journey and uh, obviously, you know, no doubt been impacted, sometimes not negatively, but, um, you know, with the conditions we've had the last couple of years, um, the last uh, the last thoughts and advice are, are yours. Yeah, well, if you know you've got something valuable, don't give up. Um, there's plenty of people out there that are wanting to support good businesses and good people. Um, and don't do it all by yourself. So, you know, either have good balance through your partner, your family, your work colleagues, your sport, whatever it is, you've got to, you know, for me, growing magic and continuing to be invested and motivated by magic is it's, I don't care if it's six in the morning or 10 at night, it just becomes part of what you do. And you've got to make sure you've got your balance um, and your support networks because they say it's lonely being a CEO or a founder. I kind of get that, but it doesn't have to be. I don't think I've ever been that lonely even when we're over in the US because you have the right people around you um, and you're doing the right things, keeping fit, um, keeping smart, meditating, whatever those sort of things are for you, you've got to have that balance that can't totally take over you. Very cool. Mate, really appreciate you taking the time. Um, fantastic story and obviously wish you well moving forward um, and really getting back out there as the world opens up again for you. Folks, thanks very much for watching. Um, this will be on demand for any of your friends or associates who didn't get the chance to watch live in about 90 minutes on KL, uh, T3 Academy, I should say, on our website, territory3.community. John, really appreciate it. Thanks for the time and thanks everyone for watching. Cheers. Uh, loved it. Thank you.